hey and welcome. I'm Dave and you are listening to Life is Peachy, a nostalgia fuel podcast that allows me to sit here and waffle on about the bands and the albums that became the soundtrack to my life. Yeah, you want some bullshit. But I can shape it, I can shift it, I can make it as real as this room. Growing up in the 90s, the early 2000s, and while we're at it, sharing a few memories from her name is Murder Productions. I can't say I was present in 1998 when Vision of Disorder released Imprint, their anticipated sophomore via Roadrunner Records, but what I can say is that within that opening sentence there is a definitive common link which eventually brought me to this band. The Long Island hardcore scene, alive and thriving and a genre bible to many, was not something on my radar as an Australian high school student in the late 90s. Mid-decade saw the beginning of alternative and heavier music sinking deep into my bloodstream. Bands like Sepultura, Pantera and, of course, Metallica were first loves and gateway bands, <laughs> eventually leading to Deftones, Korn, and a plethora of artists expanding my mind and consciousness towards any form of aggressive, emotive music. You gonna be like this? God damn, that's the crack I made in my life! What? After having said all of this, if I dig deeper and look even further back to my childhood, perhaps a band like The Doors actually instigated it all in the very beginning. You actually put your dick in this woman, Jim? Well, sometimes, yeah. Gonna win, yeah, we're taking over. Come on! Either way, it's all about climbing the ladder and following the breadcrumbs. And by 1998, I was well and truly falling into a deep obsession with Roadrunner Records. What? Did we just become best friends? Yep. The definitive common link. (laughs) Roadrunner's back catalogue definitely introduced me to a stack of bands I perhaps would have otherwise come across in a pre-social media world and when the internet was still in its humble early years. Plus, (laughs) as mentioned, I was from Australia, on the other side of the world from where a lot of this music was actually coming from. I would say it was around this time, perhaps 2000, 2001, while working my way through all the releases available to me via Roadrunner, I finally came across Imprint. obvious this is by no means a new metal album and I'll be honest I never grew up with hardcore music and I had little knowledge of its history, its journey, the way of life and the profound impact it had on those in love with it 
and the scene. But as I've always said, a good song is a good song, and literally within the first seconds of opening track, What You Are, I was taken by Chokehold. But David, is this new metal hardcore? <laughs> scream his intensity his pounding unrelenting delivery of emotion and narrative had me under a spell Thing so unique about Vision of Disorder is that melting pot of sound infused with that hardcore brickwork and ethos. And this is executed so well with Imprint. isn't another album like it and today we have the absolute privilege of celebrating and taking a deep dive into Vision of Disorder's massive middle finger to everything and everyone that ever doubted them. Tim Williams, welcome to the Life is Peachy podcast. Thank you for your time and energy and I'll just say it straight away. <laughs> Thank you for imprints. <laughs> What's going on? How are you? Oh man, I am good. <laughs> many, many <laughs> thanks for taking the time to make this happen so we can look back on 25 years of imprint. <laughs> Crazy. Wow. Yeah, no problem. This album is something else and I don't know how to articulate it. It's just so relentless, so unforgiving. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. What's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the following words? Imprint 25 years. Well, it's been a while, I guess. <laughs> you know, it doesn't seem yep. that long. I don't feel old. I don't feel like the songs and the music that we did, especially with the imprint record, I don't feel like it's that old, but it is. Maybe I don't want to believe it's that old. <laughs> it's like looking in a mirror, only not. Yeah, it must feel somewhat surreal. Yeah, no, that's 25 years. It's a lot of time. That's a major chunk of somebody's life, you know? 25 years on, that intensity and aggression, it's all there. and in my opinion, has gone on to make Imprint stand the test of time. Yeah, thank you. There's never enough time. In uh, episode 14 of the Life is Peachy podcast, Joey D'Amico, guitarist for 40 Blow Summer, he referenced the Long Island hardcore scene and VOD in particular as a huge influence while growing up and writing his own music. The metal and hardcore scene growing up in New York and Long Island was a huge influence. So bands like Vision of Disorder, I grew up nice. watching them come up in Long Island. So it was also an inspiration saying, wow, these guys made it. We can maybe do something like that one day. Like that was a huge influence on me and Max as well. Yeah, so then what were your influences leading into the formation of Vision of Disorder? Uh, well, there was a lot of them. But since mm. I can remember <laughs> back as far as grammar school, I was always into some sort of rock. 
like Molly Crew, Van Halen, you know, in the really, really early years. And then as I got a little bit older, I got into stuff like Metallica, Megadeth, Halloween. Like I'll always remember that band because I really got into them for a while. Slayer, all the classic metal bands. And then I kind of dropped off a little bit and then I started to find my musical footing. Started to realize more and more that I was going to become some sort of singer. At this point, I still really didn't know. But as I was in my infancy of being a singer, I was really into U2 for a lot of years. I know that might be strange, but it did help me. I used to sing along to that stuff, every album, all the time. It was one of the things I did when I was young. I got into The Doors, which was... Yeah, huge. man. That was the band that really pushed me into being like, that's it. When I discovered Jim Morrison, that was it. I was set on a track that would land right here today talking to you with everything that has happened between then and now fake hero i was a massive influence because that's what really got me to want to seek out a band put myself out there you know because again i didn't play any instruments i was just a singer and i wasn't really even a singer at that i was very young and then i slowly started getting into metal again and hanging out with mike kennedy and, and matt baumbach That's when the more predominant influences came in, such as Pantera, which was huge. Pantera, Black Sabbath, Biohazard, Life of Agony, all the local hardcore bands, Sick of It All, Madball, all them really started to really be a heavy influence on me. In the beginning of my career with VOD would be those influences. A lot of Long Island bands, Neglect, disciplinary action were just huge influences on me and definitely laid a foundation for me to grow off of. A lot of people always seem to ask me, where did the Sing Scream thing come from? I was really into the doors. Those guys were playing heavy music and I just started singing over parts as opposed to screaming. Like I really didn't even, in the beginning, I didn't scream. I didn't know how to scream. This is really early. This is way before our first demo. And then I slowly started trying to scream and then it started to happen. Mm -hmm. Those would be the early influences. And then obviously, as I gained my confidence as a singer and a lyricist, I started bringing in other influences. And needless to say, that would be like Alice in Chains was enormous, Jane's Addiction, Deftones, stuff yes. like that really influenced me a lot as well. Sepultura, all kinds of stuff like that. They were so damn good. They had a high density of good songs because not only were they good musicians, Ray and Robbie and John, but Jim was a tremendous poet. It's always quite hard to uh, pick a favorite song in any situation. But when it comes to The Doors, for me, it has to be Five to One. Five to One's an incredible song. Blood Simple did a cover of that. That's somewhere out there in the universe. Oh, nice. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll have to link that in the episode details. Yeah, yeah, that was a lot of fun too. Yeah, we did that as a B-side on the second Blood Simple record, which would be Red Harvest. I'm sure you could find it on YouTube. I've never mm. seen it released anywhere. It now makes sense why you would cover that. Yeah, we did that. I couldn't tell you what my favorite song is by The Doors. You know, I could tell you my favorite album would be Morrison Hotel. Nice. 
It runs through from, uh, you know, Break On Through, their flagship first song. It went all the way through the seven albums down to L.A. Woman. You know the day destroys the night, night divides the day. Try to run, try to hide, break on through to the other side. Break on through to the other side, break on through to the other side. I had to pick a door song. I don't know. It's really hard, but like, it's so hard. <laughs> uh, yeah, Peace Frog. Always love that. That's a really great one. Waiting for the Sun's really great. Yeah, great song, man. The music's over because some of the songs that were really instrumental and amazing in my youth, I listened to them so much. It's almost like I don't even know if I can listen to them anymore. Mm. I can go on and on. The amount of times I've played that band, every single song they've ever done. You almost can't put a number on it. Some of the live versions that they put out have been really cool. Ugh. Live at the Hollywood Bowl was amazing to see at the cinema. They played it actually just a couple of years ago in the Netherlands. It was amazing. Yeah, that would be awesome. You know, what it was about the doors as you get older, I don't know whether they know it or not, just how heavy that band was at points in their songs and parts of their songs and five to one is one of those no one was doing anything like that when those guys put that record out i vividly remember when i was a kid hearing the doors thanks to my mum, and it completely blew my mind yeah. most likely because it was probably the first heavy band i came across without really knowing what that meant at the time was always aware that for me at least they seemed like they had the most unique way of songwriting I had ever heard and yeah. this was eons <laughs> before I started actually getting into more alternative and eventually heavy music as a young teenager the doors were so raw we want the world and we want it we want the world and we want it yeah. But this lasts and inspires, so let's get it on. Uh, I, <laughs> I often laugh when I'm thinking about them because I sometimes imagine them as the first Ross Robinson produced band ever to exist. <laughs> Absolutely, I don't know. If you ask me, they were just a really good representation of an American rock and roll band. The doors were it. You're talking about this band with so much passion. If you can put yourself back into the headspace of the early 90s, what did Vision of Disorder mean to you in 1992 when it all began? Well, it meant everything to me, especially then. Forget it. It was our entire lives. Little hand says it's time to rock and roll. And it was like that for a very, very long time. There was nothing else. That was the number one thing. Everything came second. Girlfriends, families, jobs, relationships. Everything came second for almost everybody in that band for a really, really long time. In 1992, we were just getting started. So it was really hard. If you're asking me the question now, no, I had no idea what the band was going to do, 
where it was going to go. It was so new, so fresh, so exciting. And it was a really crazy time because it was really evolving very quickly. I don't know if it was timing or luck or we were pretty good at what we did. I always say it's a combination of everything because not one thing gets you somewhere in the music business. My experience, a lot of the bands that I've seen, heard, and know, a lot of it's timing, luck, how much money you got behind you, and also one of the biggest things, what does the individual, what is success to them? What is success in your mind as a musician? Yeah, in general, within any person, I think that's a very important question. Only a person can answer that for themselves, but I don't want to trail too far off what your question was. Just to kind of bring it back to what we were talking about, it was all happening very quickly. And it was really exciting, really fresh, and really new. To dig a bit further, how did those experiences surrounding the self-titled debut impact the writing and actual mindset coming into Imprint? <laughs> It was a lot of influences uh, and a lot of things happened. Oh, how do I put this without sounding like a dickhead? Uh, <laughs> like I was telling you before, everything was happening very quickly, like at a steady pace where it wasn't like we did something and then things went quiet and we lost a member and we took six months off and we had some really shitty shows and decided to call, you know, none of that was happening. Everything we were doing was adding up to something else. And the next thing was even bigger and more exciting. Yeah. We were really gaining a lot of fans at a super fast pace. Raiden? It's a new look. We were starting to go out of state. We went from playing small ass clubs in Long Island, 92, 93, to bigger clubs on Long Island in 94, to playing in the city in 94, 90 whatever, getting in New York's hardest and then winding up being the opening track on this super amazing compilation that still holds water today. And things were just happening. and. We were getting bigger and bigger, and along with that, our songs were getting better and better. Like, I don't know if we found our confidence or we found what our sound was at that point, and we were just working off of that, and the songs were getting better and better. Shows were getting bigger and bigger. The record deal came, and then all of a sudden, wound up in the studio, and things kind of didn't go like we thought they were going to go. Fell apart a little bit. This program to bring you a special report. So we were getting some life lessons. They were at a big cost to our egos. I don't want to get too much into what happened with the first record, but it wasn't like a fully focused, positive experience. If anything, looking back on it, it was a massive learning experience, and we're lucky we got out of it. People seem to like that record, but if you ask anybody in the band, no one likes the way that record sounds. Sounds like shit. It wasn't our best performance, but I guess for a first record, it did its job. Your early work was a little too new wave for my taste. Sports came out in 83. I think they really came into their own, commercially and artistically. 
So we learned the lesson there, just being in a recording environment. We got our asses kicked in there and we learned a lot. And there's no way, especially me as the singer, was going to repeat any of those mistakes going into imprint. Went from a local level of touring, now we're starting to do national tours with national bands. And when I say national bands, and I'm not saying anything disrespectful to anybody we played with, because everything was great. But we're playing now with bands who are professionals, who are really fucking good at what they do. And they're not just good at playing their instruments, they're good at getting on stage, getting from show to show, getting paid. Putting on incredible fucking shows, killer merch. Like we went on tour with Sick of It All in Europe and they're just like a professionally fully oiled touring machine. To watch those guys rip through that tour, we were going okay, kind of well received. You know, back then in Europe, we weren't doing any festivals. We might have did one or two festivals. It was all club shows with Sick of It All and the consensus was in some areas, we weren't hardcore enough. Like Sick of It All had a very rigid hardcore fan base. So we were kind of getting a little kicked around a little bit by the audiences. Like some of them didn't like us, they made you know it. Then enter the Ozfest in 97. And now we're on tour with bands like Neurosis, Downset, Cold Chamber. They're blowing up every fucking night. They're just destroying. They're like the most talked about band on the Ozfest, killing it every night, same stage as us. Pantera, Marilyn Manson. And again, we did pretty well, but especially on the Ozfest, we did not feel accepted by our peers. What are you gonna do? Life's a bitch and then you die, right? Sometimes. Sometimes life's a bitch and then you keep living. didn't feel 100% welcome by certain bands, not gonna name any names, but it affected us. There were bands that did embrace us, Pantera, Neurosis, some of the other bands on the bill, but we walked away kind of with a bad taste in our mouth, feeling like, were we good enough? Were we metal enough? It was a good experience, but it was unsettling, would be the word. And that had a heavy influence on us going into imprint. We were angry. We thought we deserved better. We thought maybe we deserved more coming off our first record. And we were determined to write the heaviest fucking record we could possibly write. Start the music. didn't want to write anything new metal -y. no disrespect, but we just didn't want anything to do with that. We didn't want to do it. We wanted to write something heavy and unapologetic. And these experiences coming off the road as a baby band back then on your first record, I think we toured for like a year and a half. We were completely different people from when we started that part of the journey to now going into Infinite. 
Yeah, I can definitely imagine you all felt like different people coming out at the end of that particular tunnel of experience. You mentioned not feeling quite accepted across various moments while touring. If we look back to the actual vision of disorder and dynamic, would you say circumstances like this brought you guys closer together as a unit or a team? We were a very close unit through the beginning of VOD, through the first record. It was all still very innocent and exciting. And the egos were already there. There's a feuds within any band, either it's spoken or unspoken, it's there. People talk about the chemistry we had and the songs we wrote and the dynamics we put into those songs. Half of them came from awkward relationships within the band. <laughs> right. <laughs> Going into Imprint, yes, we were all on the same page. Everybody was still pretty happy. At that point, we were still all full-time musicians and very focused still. VOD was still number one in everybody's life. We were all pretty damn focused. We practiced every day five days a week, all afternoon, sometimes into the night, every single solitary day. It was nothing else. Because only one thing counts in this life. Get them to sign on the line which is dotted. Always be closing. I remember we had a studio in Long Beach. Now we're in the imprint years, writing imprint. And it's always weird when you start writing a record. It's a very intimidating time because you really don't have it. And especially again for us, we were still all still very young. I might have been 23. Honestly, Fleisch was younger. He was maybe 20, 21. And everybody else around the same age. We're on a pretty big label. They just gave us a chunk of money. They're giving us a really great producer, Sardi. We have a new A&R guy, which was a little weird, but he was very interested and involved, which is all you really need out of an A&R person. You know, you need somebody who's gonna be in your corner. And it was Mike Gitter, and he was into it. in the band and he understood the band which is rare because a lot of people did not understand VOD and they fucked it up but anyway that's another story and now for something completely different we were in the studio every day and like I was saying in the beginning you have nothing you're starting the first rip of something that's supposed to turn into a record so it's always a little slow and a little weird at first but we were all focused we had the studio in Long Beach or we had just moved into it it was right down by the ocean in a pool part of town where a lot of our friends live. That was part of the journey, getting down there by the beach and stuff like that, and hanging out in the studio that was ours and it was a 24 seven room. It wasn't like you rented it for a couple hours and left. This was before people were emailing tracks around and writing full records in their underwear in their <laughs> house, you know? I don't want to sound too old, but when you had to get into a smelly, stinky, often hot studio with five guys, and throw it out, write some sweaty, heavy fucking music, and that's what we did. Slider. You stink. There wasn't too much partying going on, at least during the writing sessions, like when we were writing and working, because again, we did it during the day. Afterwards, you know, we'd go out and cut loose and stuff like that. But, you know, during the day, it was all business. Once we got into that studio on Long Beach and started to get some songs under our belt and started to get into a routine, I remember I'd go to the gym in the morning, I'd sleep in a little bit, go to Boston Market for lunch, go to the studio, blast out a bunch of whatever we were doing that day, then I would punch out all the lyrics right then and there, and then the next day I would come in, all the lyrics would be done, the vocals would be done, and we were just knocking them out.
sounds pretty nice, if, um, to be honest. There's nothing better than having that flow and a structured routine in place that ticks those boxes. I uh, love to try and maintain that whenever I'm out on tour, especially taking as much as I can from my day-to-day -day life, you know, taking that with me on the road to maintain predominantly uh, my mental health. Uh, yeah. You know, things like running, my diet, my work ethic, all those things definitely need to be in check and in some sort of balance in order for me to carry it out on a creative level. Do you think I'm weird? Definitely. No, man, seriously. Am I weird? Yeah, but so what? Everybody's weird. How did you guys come to work with Dave Sardi and what did he bring to the recording experience? We were obviously demoing stuff. We didn't just come into Roadrunner with full records. You know, we gave him little updates as we went along. I do believe other producers were offered to us. I got to be honest, I don't want to say the wrong name. I think Andy Sneak was one of them, possibly Robinson. But whatever happened, it didn't go the way it wanted to go. Oh man, that would have been interesting. <laughs> yeah, I know. They wanted us to go back with Jamie Locke. We didn't want to do that. And then Sardi's name was in there. There might have been a couple others. Again, I don't really remember, so I don't want to say anything. But uh, Sardi, we liked his history, the, some of the stuff he did at that point. I know Bark Market was one of the big, I think that was his band. And he did a couple of different bands that we liked the sound. And he also did some bigger stuff. I think he already did something with the Chili Peppers by then. Yeah, he was the mixer for one hot minute. So he was a big name. I do believe we spoke to him a couple of times over the phone. And I think we even had a meeting with him again. You're talking 25 years ago. It's really mm. hard to remember every <laughs> single detail. But what I will tell you I remember is the day he finally did come, we actually did pre-production with the producer, which is unheard of for VOD until this moment in time. Something we never did either on the first record. Every other record I've ever done since then, there's always been a pre-production session. It's like fucking common sense, you know? So he comes down to the studio thinking again, I told you we were by the ocean, but we weren't really that close, you know? And he comes down in this old beat up hippie van, like those VW vans with a surfboard in the back, his sunglasses on. And it's just like, this guy even come down to do any music or is he just going to like the beach? And he's just the most unassuming, mellow guy. And that's right away something I really, really liked about him. No ego. Again, the guy's done some big stuff. He's just doing like this small little VOD hardcore band as like a God knows what, maybe he's bored. I don't know. He comes into the studio and he doesn't really say much. He kind of just lets the songs go. Surfer. He's just listening to everything. He makes a suggestion here and there. His biggest remark and contribution to the pre-production sessions was he changed something in the Phil song. That was like the biggest thing he did. Everything else, he was just like, you guys pretty much are dialed in pretty tight from what I can hear now. Just keep doing what you're doing. We'll do this for a week and then that's it. You're going into the studio. And that's pretty much how it went up until then. Wanting people to listen, you can't just tap them on the shoulder anymore. You have to hit them with a sledgehammer. And then you'll notice you've got their strict attention. So is there anything you'd like to reflect on with regards to having Phil Anselmo appear on By the River? How did all of that come to be? That's a big part of imprint. I remember we had all these songs. I don't even know what it was called up until this part, but whatever, we called the Phil song now for obvious reasons, right? But there was a point in time where it wasn't called anything. It was just a song we had. And we weren't really sure. I had my vocals on it was kind of scattered. 
we all liked it, but we didn't really know what the hell we were going to do with it. But I know me and Kennedy were riding home one day from practice and we were like, we got to do something on this record to make it special. We don't really like using guest vocalists or guest musicians or anything, but on this record, we should definitely do something. We just felt like we needed it. We wanted it. We wanted something special for the record. There was a lot riding on this record and we wanted it to go as best as it can go. And I remember being like, well, should we get Jamie from Hapri? Should we get Freddie from Madball? Then I was just like, what if I ask Phil? And he's like, why? What are you crazy? <laughs> At that point, we were pretty close with him. At least I was. We had just bonded pretty hard on the Ozfest, got to know him pretty well. And we had talked a bunch of times and stuff like that. We've hung out. I went down there to his house for Halloween and stuff. So we were friendly and we were on a phone call basis. So yeah, I called him up. He said, absolutely, I'll definitely do it. Do you mind if we do it here in a studio down here? I said, no problem. Bring it down to you. No problem at all. We sent them the track. I remember I flew down there for like a long weekend and we did the track. And it was really an incredible experience, needless to say. Oh, I'm sure. That's what I meant when earlier in the conversation. Things just kept happening The VOD at this point. Doors were just opening and things were just falling into place. And that was one of them. I'm sitting next to one of my biggest heroes in a fucking studio environment, watching him track vocals. Not many people have ever seen that guy even do that. <sighs> That's so cool. It was incredible. We hung out. We had a great weekend. You know, we went to a couple of restaurants together. It was a very mellow weekend. It was the polar opposite of the Halloween weekend when I went down there for Halloween. That was crazy. <laughs> this was for seeing this guy on his level. He wasn't putting on the big rock star show. He wasn't doing the shit backstage that he did at all the big amphitheaters and 50,000 people around and all sorts of people around to impress. It was just him, his girlfriend, a girlfriend of mine, and myself for the whole weekend. No one else was around. We went to a bunch of local joints, ate, drank, ordered in food to his house. And I'll tell you one of the best moments of that entire weekend we recorded everything, it went really well. The track sounded incredible. I was sitting in his living room and he was just like, you wanna hear it? You know, we're all buzzed by now, you know, pretty much wrong. You wanna hear the track? And we just both sat on his couch, blasted the fucking track. And that was insane. That was a really <sighs> yeah, cool man. moment. Being in that guy's living room, listening to this track that you just did. You knew you had an incredible thing going. You know, to fly home with that and all of the VOD guys had heard it, we all met up played it for them and watch their faces drop when they heard it and then bringing it into Roadrunner and watching Monty Connor's face turn white when he heard the screams in the breakdown in the middle of the song. That's an epic song that nobody can touch in the metal world, particle world, for better or for worse. No one can say anything about that song. That is an incredible song. Is it good for you? <laughs> I've had better. with two incredible vocalists at their peak performances, I would say. Yeah, definitely. Because Phil really, I've seen him do guest tracks on other songs. He really put a lot of work into that fucking track. He liked VOD a lot. He was very into the whole underground thing. Saw us as an underground band, possibly breaking through. He really hooked it up on that, and I stand by that. Yeah, man, when you talk about peak performance, I was just about to say something similar. Oh, Phil coming out of the great Southern Trend Kill, his delivery and expression at that point in time of his career was just on another level. And then to partner it with your voice on this track, for sure, this song is a classic. He was really into it, he was into the track. There was none of that shit you hear about him. Because he's had some issues, we all know, and he was coherent. 
He wrote the fucking lyrics, went over the lyrics with me, helped me name the title of the song. When it came down to performing, there was no bullshit. He was completely straight, and we just had an afternoon together in the studio. A room that I guess he's comfortable working in, and it was great. It was fucking great. Too. pleasure to <laughs> listen to the two of you going back and forth on by the river it's just so heavy vocally <laughs> had my little spiel here talking all about Phil's voice, but I have to be honest, I've been really, really excited to sit and talk to you about your performance on Imprint. All right, cool. Because yeah, I'm just gonna go out and say it. I think what you've done on this album is, and still is, oh, some of the heaviest stuff out there. It's with little breathing space for the listener and your vocals pound like a fist of bricks or something <laughs> what was the process or the techniques involved in getting to that place and laying out that emotion because the vocal takes sound so <laughs> unforgiving it's where i was at at that time if i had something in me in my mind i had a lot to prove at that point I was still, again, very young. I had a lot to prove in my mind. Coming off of that first record, like I said, it was a very different experience. Being in the studio with everybody else in the band, in the control room on the first record, like all yelling through the talk back thing, do it this way, do it that way, do it. Like driving me out of my fucking mind. I vowed never to have any of them ever in the room with me ever again. <laughs> when I was tracking and to this day, no one ever is around when I'm tracking. I don't want anybody near me, anybody with me, anybody in the room, but me and the guy I'm working with, hands down, that's the way it's been since Imprint. And that was part of it to show these guys in my band who could be overbearing at times, you know, whatever, it's all good, that stay the fuck out of this. I got this, you're not fucking coming down until I tell you to come down. And they stayed away and look what happened. It was incredible. That played a part in it. Also, I try to explain a lot of, maybe people know this, maybe they don't. Like I told you, I was in really good shape then, screaming, singing every single day, going to the gym every day, was not partying that much, taking things very seriously, anywhere from the lyrics to the vocal performance. <laughs> To just being primed and in perfect vocal shape to be able to just destroy it and do it every single day. Never lost my voice. Sardi always came in most of the day, but I worked a lot with his engineer. You develop relationships with these people. These are very intense moments in time. I'm sure it goes like this for musicians or like guitar players and drummers and bass players and whatever you want to call yourself. But for a vocalist, for me, I get very into people. It takes a lot for me to, first of all, get to even know somebody or even like somebody. And I'm older now, so I'm a lot more reserved, but when I was younger, there were just walls up everywhere. And if I was able to get through those walls and get to this person and we had a connection, that connection was tight. And we 
develop these super intense relationships, at least I do with my producers and engineers, because you can spend anywhere from a month to two months to three months with them. They're in your fucking life every day, and they're doing a serious job that's going to affect your life big time. So naturally, his engineer was a really great guy. Again, real mellow. Didn't have much to say, but said what he needed to say. And he was a great engineer. I felt during Imprint, I had a lot of confidence and I felt very comfortable. And again, Sardi would pop in every once in a while, check it, say this and say that. But he was very mellow. I felt very, very comfortable around him. So I'm just banging it out every day, man. Every day. I think that whole record took like 20 something days. remember this picture within the album booklet you're hunched over maybe even collapsed on the floor shirtless with the mic cupped and close to your face and you're just screaming your guts out yeah i know exactly what you're talking about that was a sardi thing the basic tracks were like recorded almost in a live setup the whole band was all set up and then i guess isolated and stuff like that the drums were being taken they were being recorded. Everybody else was playing along. And for a, a couple of days, maybe we were getting tempos and stuff like that. Or basically, all the basic tracks were getting done. And he set me up in a side booth with, like you saw, I think that was an SM57 microphone. And I'm plugged into a track. And I'm fucking screaming my head off. Doing what I do. I'm going through the songs, but it's not takes. I'm not doing like, all right, just do the verses. Do this first 900 fucking times. You know what I'm saying? This was a live recording. Especially, here's something for the 25th anniversary uh, interview. That one scream for sure in Landslide. Why you trying to home? That is from the basic tracks. That is something that was a moment in time that was just done that one time and that's it. And that went on the record. Everyone's gonna go listen to that exact moment in Landslide right now, I'm sure of it. <laughs> but just make sure that you come back and listen to the rest of the interview. Yeah, cheers. <laughs> I even remember Sardi telling me, first of all, I was like, hey, I can't, you know, I was just, he had to keep reminding me at this point, we're not listening to the vocals right now, we're listening to the drums. <laughs> Don't worry, there'll be plenty of time for you, but at one point, we were listening, he's like, that is incredible. That's staying just like that. Wow, you're amazing, dude. That was from those early takes in the sessions. I guess easy to feel like there's one main gear, so to speak, with Imprint, but the reality is there's actually quite a lot happening vocally throughout the album. It's these moments that kind of create that necessary space for the listener to catch their breath and let what's going on really sink in. I always thought it's really impressive that somehow you still found the room to facilitate the use of cleans at all. <laughs> and it's a real tip of the hat to you as a vocalist, man. Thank you. Going into Imprint, I was starting to sing more confidently, better and stronger. And that was definitely represented in uh, What You Are. Imprint the song had kind of a different singing flavor and then needless to say Jada Blue. Early 
earlier you mentioned something that has just really stuck with me, that being Monty Connor's face turning white in reaction to first hearing By the River with Phil. It's, of course, Roadrunner Records, so a lot of people listening probably grew up with this label and all the bands on their roster. Yeah. Coming into the writing and recording of Imprint, what was life like for VOD on Roadrunner Records at that point in time? Listen, we need to have a talk about Vanderhoff. The fact is, he's the sponsor. And you signed a contract guaranteeing him certain concessions, one of them being a spot on the show. Well, that's where I see things just a little differently. <laughs> At that point, things were still pretty good, I would say. If we're talking imprint, things were good. VOD still had a lot of steam then. Still pretty damn big in the Northeast. We did odds best. We got a couple of pretty big breaks that came either through Roadrunner or on our own. Things were going still pretty good. You know, Roadrunner, looking back, it's not a secret that they were really pretty terrible to their bands. Unless you were like Slipknot or Machine Head, you either had, which we discovered, there was either the metal deal or the hardcore deal. And we definitely had the hardcore deal, which wasn't as lucrative. It wasn't packed with money, like the Typos, the Fiat Factory, Sepultura, like those bands were getting all the money. We were getting something, but not what we thought was enough. Especially back then, you needed money to get places. You really did. It was part of the puzzle. You know, there's certain things that need to fit into place for you to go somewhere in the business back then. They were pretty bad. You know, they had that built-in merch wing, Blue Grape, who just ass fucked a million bands, and we were one of them. That's pretty terrible what they did to their artists. But at that point, Monty was always a champion for us. He believed in VOD. He was a fan of VOD, and what he did what he could when he wasn't our A&R guy. And we came in with Howie Abrams, who was very good, very passionate. He knew a lot and he knew a lot of people and how he just wasn't like an empty suit. Like he knew the business, he knew the bands, he knew stuff. He was not an idiot. And the same thing with Gitta. Gitta was new, at least to us, to our experience with him. He was pretty passionate also. Roadrunner, you know, sink or swim, you're either selling records or you're not. Imprint was still pretty good, but towards the tail end of Imprint, a couple of bad things happened, which unfortunately would lead to us leaving Roadrunner, but that's not what this interview is about. <laughs> to be or not to be? Not to be. Yeah, sure, I un understand that. How did the songs from Imprint go over live once you were able to get out there and start playing them to the fans? You trust me? Of course I trust you. At this point, VOD really could do no wrong in the eyes of our fans. We were still killing it. We always killed it, but obviously as things later down the line, you know, we might have lost a couple of fans. But anyway, in Imprint, we were still killing it. We were destroying people. We were still heavily into touring and we were out there playing shows. And the new songs were I don't remember them being not well received. People just started going ape shit right away. A song like Imprint, that song is still one of my favorite songs. It's just a lethal song. And what it is more than anything, it's a lethal vision of the sort of song. Mm. Not many bands sounded like us. How many bands did what we did and we used to bring it every single night we still do to this day 
and imprint that song, people would just lose their minds to it. People lost their minds to what you are. Landslide, like landslide's not really in the set as much anymore, but back then we would play that and people would go fucking crazy to that song. We were doing some big tours, you know, we went out with Sepultura. That was an incredible tour. I think Earth Crisis was on that. That was a national run and every night the shows were packed and we were destroying. our merch people were really eating it up and we were doing well we went to japan and did pretty well over there and japan was always really good for us we went to australia austria <laughs> well then <laughs> good day mate <laughs> let's put another shrimp on the barbie that was cool well, that was far away and we had fans there it was really wild getting that far out in the world and a lot of people showing up at the shows knowing the songs going crazy, like New Zealand. We did a full Japanese run too. We did like everywhere. It was a really long tour. It was incredible. It was great. Oh, yeah, going to all these places, vibing with fans all over the world. And like you said, literally the other side of the world with your music. <laughs> Yeah, it was really, that one Japanese tour, we were gone for like a month, a month and a half. Usually you go to Japan for a week and you come home. I think we went there for a week and we flew to Australia for a week. Then we went to New Zealand for a couple of days, back to Japan for like another week and a half. I don't know, what, we were gone a long time. During that international tour cycle, did you guys ever play 12 Steps to Nothing? I always liked that song a lot. Honestly, if we did play it, we didn't play it that much. Oh man, that song is insane. Yeah, that's a really great one. I know we played Jada Bloom a lot. He used to say, What You Are, Imprint. We, never, we used to play the end of the Phil song all the time. That was great. That was my idea. <laughs> <laughs> we only got to play the Phil song one time live. I had Brian from Shadows Fall. He came out and did it with us. That was cool. One of the DODs. First reunion shows back in the city at Irving Plaza. I invited Brian up. It was great. It was really cool to play that. Even for me, it was cool to play this all. I've never been there, but I read about it in a book. <laughs> it's cool to uh, hear specifics about certain tracks from imprints, but selfishly, as this is one of my personal favorites from the album, what memories do you have for the song Jada Bloom? You kind of knew that that was going to be the last song. Yeah. You know, with that track, obviously, it just had a really almost emo feel to it. And uh, I think Mike Kennedy mainly wrote a lot of that song. The vocals just clicked with it. There was some real parts to that song, some really cool stuff. You know, a lot of singers will tell you, or streamers and stuff like that, more times than not, you'll have these super aggressive singers that at some point in their career start singing, at least sometimes. And they always talk about how liberating it feels and how different they are and how different it is to be doing that. And at that point, VOD was still kind of into doing a lot of singing, so it wasn't too far of a reach for me on the first record and all sorts of stuff we did. But that there was some special lyrics on there. The singing parts on that song were really felt. They felt good going by. They felt nice singing stuff like that. It was a cool part. Some dark lyrical content, I would say they're pretty personal, especially towards the end. Cuts and bruises, bruises and scabs. Find it really hard to laugh. It says the tears as the crystal blue. Three days and still no sleep. You know, it doesn't take a genius to put that together. 
Yeah, and as we come to the closing of the album, it really feels as if we have rounded off a very specific experience. The yeah. album has become a journey. everything off and brings some sense of closure in quite a profound way. Yeah, it's definitely one of the better VOD songs and we always wind up playing that and keeping the ballistic for it. It's a cool song to sing. You know, there was room there for me. The rest of that record, like you said, there was a lot of beating over the head shit. And as a musician and as a singer, if you're in the game long enough and you stick around and you're lucky enough to stick around, whatever, you naturally grow as a singer. And I could pinpoint songs and times in my career that I know that I've grown. Well, I was one singer before it, and now I'm a different type of singer after because I've grown, whether it was the influences, the experiences, personal experiences. With the 25 years of retrospect on both a creative and personal level, what does Imprint mean to you and where does it sit with you in your life and back catalogue of work? Imprint sits high. I'm very lucky, humble and grateful that I have done some incredible stuff before and after Imprint. Nine times out of ten people always reference Imprint. It means a lot to me. It means a lot because it did a lot for a lot of people. Like you said, it still holds up today. It's a ferocious representation of what Vision of Disorder is and was capable of. A lot of people say that was a trailblazer record that influenced metalcore and spawned all these bands from Killswitch Engage to I don't know what else. But that's an incredible thing to hear from people. Very humbling. It just sits very high. It was a great time for the band, great time for myself. We really gave it, we really put it out there on that one. Very proud of it to be a part of that record. This is one of those rare moments where your ass get a chance to be completely honest. Tim, thank you so much for the music and for putting it all out there for us to enjoy and continue to enjoy 25 years later. That's... Uh, the amazing thing about music, right, that it can last over the years and Imprint most definitely still resonates and hits hard. So on behalf of myself and the VOD fans, I really would love to thank you for taking the time to look back on this album and sharing your reflections and memories with all of us. Is there anything you'd like to update us with, you know, um, in regards to what's going on in your world right now? No, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm glad we got it done. Thanks, man. Oh, yeah. For me, you know, I'm still out here, still being creative. It's very important. It's important for anybody out there who is creative to stay creative. I feel like I'm in a good place right now. I'm happy. That's so great. Happy that I finally just released Rolling Coffin, Product of Demise. It's out there and it's doing pretty well. So if anybody wants to listen to that or want to pick it up, go to Static Hour Records or you can get it anywhere that you get it digitally. Very proud of it. It's cool. It's a little different, but it is a representation of myself. I wrote all the music. Had a, my co-producer obviously co-produce it and my co-writer helped me write it, record it. Most of all, it's a lot of my guitar playing, so it's a cool moment. As for VOD, whenever that whole world gets rolling again, fine, you know, that'll be cool. You know, that's it. Thank you for listening to all my projects throughout all the years, everybody out there. Hope you enjoy this interview and thank you very much for the opportunity. As you can probably hear, 
Peter. I loved the opportunity to chat with Tim and give praise to Imprint. And while we're here, I also recommend checking out 2001's From Bliss to Devastation. I really slept on this one back in the day and in revisiting it just recently, this album is amazing. Once again, such a great example of the band progressing their sound, staying true to their roots. But this one incorporates, I would say, some grunge elements. Yeah, it's really, really pissed off, amazing album, but also with a lot of melody. So make sure you check that out. Excellent. And if you want to support what I do here, then you can do so over at patreon.com slash life is peachy podcast. And well, until we hang out again, thank you for your time and energy and see you at the party, Richter. You know, I can uh, eat a peach for hours. This episode was written, edited, and produced by myself. Recorded from the comfort of my own home. DIY style. With each guest calling in from wherever they happen to be around the world at that particular time. The Life is Peachy theme song is an original tune for this podcast. Written by Tim Richardson. The Life is Peachy podcast is not monetized. All music rights and credits go to its rightful owners. Further details can be found in the description of the specific episode. All artwork is original and illustrated for the Life is Peachy podcast by Chris Lisa Leafting. The greatest feeling you can get in a gym or the most satisfying feeling you can get in a gym is the pump.